Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. I'm honoured to be here on the territories of the Musqueam, of the Squamish, of the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. We're honoured to be here on their lands. I wanted to uh, let uh, people, because people are on the phone with us from the media, know who will be speaking today to start with. Uh, be myself, followed by the Minister of Labour, Harry Baines, the Honourable Harry Baines, the Secretary Business Manager of the HEU, Mina Broussard, the uh, Minister of Education, Jennifer Whiteside, and Catalina, Catalina Sampson, who's a dietary aide at Vancouver General Hospital. We're honoured to have them there. We also have um, other guests uh, with us today. Betty Valenzuela, the Financial Secretary of the Hospital Employees Union, is here. Uh, Barb Niederpaul, who's the President of the Hospital Employees Union here. You know, I'm, uh, I'm getting some help here. I like that. I like that. I need that. I need it quite a bit. And um, the former uh, Secretary Business Manager of the Hospital Employees Union, the former Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and a great friend, uh, Judy Darcy, is here as well. And we're honoured to have all of them here on what is truly, I think, a significant day in, in health care in British Columbia. It's a significant day for thousands of healthcare workers. It's a significant day for um, our healthcare system. It's a significant day for hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of patients in healthcare who will, be get, who will get more support when the healthcare team is brought back together, get more support when we, the, the quality of care is supported, get more support when people who give their lives to public healthcare are treated with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. Um, today, I am honoured to announce that the province and the health authorities will serve notice under the terms of 21 commercial service contracts and start to repatriate housekeeping and food service contracts. This move will improve wages, working conditions, job security and stability for approximately 4,000 healthcare workers in 2,900 FTE positions who rely on their jobs and the countless patients that they help every day. By promoting a stable and effective workforce, government will be better positioned to attract, uh, to offer attractive job op options to people interested in joining the healthcare workforce. This will be good for patients. It will be good for the quality of service. It will be good for healthcare workers. And of course, of course, there is a significant history and story behind it. And some of the people who will be joining us to speak today will speak to some of these issues, but I wanted to lay them out. I think many people in British Columbia understand and uh, understand the significance of what we're announcing today. In uh, January of 2002, January 27th through January 29th, uh, the government of British Columbia of the day introduced uh, Bill 29. They subsequently in 2003 uh, introduced a bill called Bill 94. And these two pieces of legislation uh, led to, as we know, the largest layoff of women workers in the history of British Columbia, but also significantly changed the health care system, in my view, for the worse. Uh, there has been, of course, a long and significant period since then. But for what it meant for many of the people working today was that they had fewer rights as workers than anyone else in society. And it meant for wages and benefits that their work was not treated with respect through our health care system. If you look at people who have worked for public health care, who have kept our hospitals safe from disease, who have cleaned our hospital and provide nutrition in our hospital, who have worked for decades in that system and do not have a pension, that tells you its significance. If Bills 29 and 94 had significance in their own time and had some argument in their own time, and obviously I don't agree that they did, they certainly don't anymore at a time when we desperately and continually are trying to bring people into our public health care system where we need health care workers. And in a period of pandemic where people, regardless of that, showed up to work to clean hospitals, showed up to work to ensure that people were fed in the most difficult and sometimes frightening of circumstances. They did extraordinary work and today's effort respects that work. You'll know that in November 
In 2018, the government brought in Bill 47, which repealed Bill 29 and 94 and had significance and showed a better way forward. And I am very proud of the fact that recognizing the struggle of workers, recognizing the struggle of their union, which was principally, although not all, exclusively the hospital employees union across the long-term care, assisted living, and of course, acute care sectors of health care. Recognizing that, the legislature voted unanimously to repeal bills 29 and 94. And we committed to working together to bring about the changes that would flow from that. And those changes gave back, of course, to workers significant power over their uh, workplaces. And we've seen that um, transform um, uh, the situation, particularly in long-term care, and continue to do that. We've seen, with respect uh, uh, to the work done by healthcare workers, especially during the pandemic, particularly after we decided the, to uh, go to a single site proposal and increase effectively wages across the sector to wage level to ensure that seniors were kept safe across our healthcare system and that workers were, kept, were treated safely. We've seen the impact of that. And we said we'd work together with, uh, as, as employers with the hospital employees union and with workers to see that change happens and change with respect to housekeeping with respect to food services in our in our acute care sector and in significant part as well of the health health already owned and operated long-term care sector is happening today we have as i said 21 commercial service contracts which over the next period leading into um, the, uh, a year from now but most of them will be done by the end of march of 2022 when when workers who are currently working for private sector employers will return to work for health authorities. We're going to see, as I say, the repatriation, which means bringing previously contracted out health services and housekeeping and food services back direct into the direct employment of the health authority with the health authority as the employer. 21 contracts will be brought back in to health authorities. And those contracts include in the Provincial Health Services Authority, housekeeping uh, contracts and patient and retail food contracts in the Vancouver Coastal and Providence Healthcare, so the same patient and retail food, housekeeping, patient food, and mixed environmental um, and housekeeping contracts. In Fraser Health, housekeeping and contracts that are mixed between housekeeping and, uh, and food services. In the Vancouver Island Health Authority, equally housekeeping and patient food contracts. As people will know who follow the sector principally in the Interior Health Authority and in the Northern Health Authority, such contracts were not contracted out at the time, partly because the value of those contracts was less, I think, in those health authorities. So these are significant changes, and they're going to make difference in the lives of people. They're going to make a significant difference in our ability to recruit people in the health authority. They're going to bring back together the health care team, people who work together side by side with different employers now will work together in common cause, uh, working and doing the important work that they do. And I just want to say and to recognize again that this has been decades of injustice that healthcare workers have gone through, decades of injustice, of not being treated fairly, of not being given benefits consistent with being someone who serves the public in the public health care system and not recognizing the profound value of their work. Anybody, anybody who works in a hospital knows how important keeping hospitals clean is to the health of patients and to the health of everybody. Everybody who works in a hospital and tries to, and tries to, um, and is recovering knows the importance and the fundamental understanding of food. This is important work. And this will allow healthcare workers affected by these contracts to receive the same wages and benefits as other healthcare workers in other health authorities who are paid to do exactly the same work. So this is about better care. This is about justice for people. This is about fairness. And this is about building a healthcare system that will continue to serve people in the decades to come. I'm proud to bring forward this initiative. I think it's one of the most important things that I have done in my, my life and, and public life to be associated with this. But the credit is not for me. It is for those who have worked so hard in public health care, those who have fought to see change happen, those who have continued to serve people even when they weren't being treated fairly with compassion and generosity. This is really 
about health care workers in this province and what they mean to all of us. And we can bang the drum at 7 o'clock, but we should do it more often. But mostly what we should do is treat people who have given their lives to our public health care system the respect they deserve. And that's what this action does today. I'm honored now to introduce uh, my colleague, the Honorable Harry Baines, the Minister of Labour, uh, the MLA for Surrey Newton, to say a few words. Harry. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, I'm really happy and excited to be here today on this a great day for workers. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging Coast Salish people, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people on whose traditional territory we are particip participating from today. Today is a long time coming, almost 20 years now, since healthcare support workers had their rights stripped away from them. For my entire career, I have seen the devastation on workers and their families when their rights are taken away. And these rights that we're talking about today of restoring were legally negotiated into the collective agreement for decades. And government with a stroke of a pen took it all away why? Because of some ideological position that they were stuck on. When we passed Bill 47 in 2018, I knew we were making a difference in their lives and their families. That's why today is an important day to me, because the rights that were stripped away from them with a stroke of a pen in early 2000 are being restored for thousands of those workers. The previous government cut jobs of these thousands of workers who were racialized and women. And that system treated them as a second class citizen. That is no more. Bill 47 set the stage and now with today changes gives back so many workers their rights that were needlessly taken away from them. This brings stability to health care, fairness and job security, respect and dignity to workers. No worker should ever feel like they are getting taken advantage of or have their rights stripped away for no reason. Bringing these workers back into the health care system alongside their allied health care professionals is the right thing to do. And something I'm so proud of that our government is doing today. This is good news for healthcare system itself because patients and their healthcare workers all depend on these support workers day in and day out. This change the Minister Dix gives these healthcare support workers certainty in their jobs and access to better working conditions while making these jobs more attractive to hire and retain staff. And I want to say thank you, Minister Dix. I want to say thank you to all of my colleagues. I want to say thank you to the representative of those workers who stood and fought long, never gave up that fight. And that's the reason we're seeing this day today, the change that we are seeing today. So I want to say thank you, all of you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Excellent Minister, Minister of Education and MLA for Newton. Oh, sorry, MLA for New Westminster. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Baines. Thank you, Minister Dix. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge we're here on the traditional territory of the Squamish, Slay with Tooth Musqueam, and Coast Salish peoples. and. I can't tell you what a great privilege it is to be here. It is so wonderful to be here with friends, with former colleagues, with current colleagues on this very, very important day. This announcement today represents literally a generation of work and advocacy. 
And my uh, thoughts and my heart today is with Catalina, who you'll hear from shortly, with Cora, with Avelina, with Juanito and John and the countless other working people who stood up for themselves and for each other in the struggle for dignity and the struggle for the recognition of the important value of their work in our healthcare system, in our communities, and to our society. This announcement will make a big difference to the healthcare workers in my community and in communities across the province. I'm so grateful to have been uh, invited to participate today, and I cannot tell you how so, so pleased I am to introduce the Secretary Business Manager of the Hospital Employees Union, Mina Brissart. Well, thank you, um, Minister Whiteside. Um, for the introduction, and thank you, Minister Baines and Minister Dix. The impact of today's announcement will be life-changing for thousands of housekeeping and dietary workers in our hospitals and extended care facilities. I, I want to take um, the time to thank our government for carrying through on their commitment to bring this work back in-house and reunite the healthcare team. The legacy of privatization has been devastating for workers and for healthcare. Nearly 20 years ago, the former government passed laws that led to the mass firing of thousands of workers. Their work was contracted out to corporations who rehired many of these uh, workers at half the wages with no pension and very few benefits. Today, these workers still earn less than they did 20 years ago. The economic impact of this privatization has been overwhelmingly shouldered by women, more than four out of five of those impacted, and by workers of color. Privatization has fragmented our healthcare team and created a significant uh, recruitment and retention crisis for jobs that are critical for safe, quality healthcare. Today, we are ending this legacy and putting healthcare on a better footing to deal with retention and recruitment issues and ensure safe, stable care for patients. We are reversing policies that marginalize women and workers of color. To our members who work in contracted housekeeping and dietary services, I want to say that today's announcement is long overdue recognition and respect for the contributions you make to healthcare and to patients and residents. Thank you for keeping the faith and fighting so hard and fighting so long to, to reunite our healthcare team. It is now my pleasure uh, to introduce Catalina Sampson. Uh, Catalina is a dietary aide at Vancouver General Hospital. Uh, her job was privatized in 2004 and she has been advocating to reunite the healthcare team ever since. So I'll let Catalina share her story. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Dix, um, Minister Dix, and welcome, uh, Catalina. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Minister Baines, Minister Dix, and Minister Whiteside. Thank you to everyone in the government who made this happen. We make such a big difference to workers like me for our healthcare system. In 2004, I went from uh, my from my earning eighteen dollars and ten cents an hour with benefits and pension to ten dollars and fifteen cents an hour. I I lost all my benefits, nothing, no sick time, no vacation, nothing at all. My life was thrown through into chaos. I had to give up on a lot of my goals. But I was lucky. Some other people 
lost so much more. Today, I make less than I did then, but I have the same job. Except my work is harder now. The workload is heavy because the staff turnover is high. New people don't stick around when they find out how hard the work is for how low the pay is. They, they, move on, they move on another job that is easier or pays more. Today's announcement will make things more stable. People will want to stay when the job gets better. I'm close to retirement. And people ask, why do you stay? I stay because I know that we can make things better for those who, ca who come behind us, for the young people, for the people who will need to do the job in the future so they can support their families doing work, uh, this work. Sometimes healthcare workers like me get overlooked, but what we do is important. Our work is always important during the pandemic and all of the time. The hospital doesn't run without us, and patient cannot recover without nourishing food or clean environment. We are a vital part of the team and, uh, and today. I feel like our work is being recognized for that. Thank you for the government for seeing that our work is important and making sure that we can do a good job for patient. And thank you to all of the workers who can't be here today, but have never given up on reuniting for healthcare uh, team. We have been working so hard with our union to make this happen, and we finally got it. I'm so pr proud of all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina, and thanks to all our speakers today for uh, for presenting uh, some of the issues involved. And we're uh, gonna go to questions now. I should let you know as well um, that, because uh, there there may be, um, as always, some questions on, on other subjects, uh, that we'll be presenting uh, modeling information, Dr. Henry and I, tomorrow in Victoria with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there'll be an opportunity then to ask questions about that. I know you, you may want to ask them today and that's, uh, that's fine, but we'll be presenting that tomorrow around midday and you'll be, people, members of the media will be receiving an advisory shortly about that. And with that, we'll roll over to questions. Thank you, Minister. A reminder to media on the phone that you may now press star one to enter the queue and you'll be limited to one question and one follow-up today. Please also remember to take your phone off mute as you are not audible until your name is called. Our first question today is from April Lawrence with Czech News. April, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Minister Dix, I, I just wanted to ask about the outbreak at the Sunset Lodge long-term care home here in Victoria. 22 people have now tested positive, 13 of them residents, and it all happened over just a couple of days. Um, I'm just wondering how concerned you are about the virus spreading that quickly through there and whether a, re a review will be done to see if it could have been better contained. Uh, first of all, uh, we do reviews in every case. So uh, there will be in that case, as you know, over the course of the pandemic, there have been relatively few uh, long-term care outbreaks on Vancouver Island because um, uh, community transmission has been lower in general on Vancouver Island than in other parts of BC, particularly in Metro Vancouver. So yes, uh, what this continues to show is that we, and we've seen it uh, through the period, to the recent period when we've had vaccination, the very, the profound, really uh, life-changing impact of vaccinations in long-term care, how we went from um, 49 outbreaks to virtually none within a month after uh, vaccination started in long-term care, both of residents and of workers and of essential 
visitors, but that the, it continues to be a possible, and we see this around BC, to have outbreaks in long-term care. And so we'll be reviewing that and taking, of course, uh, uh, good care of people and ensuring that that doesn't happen. What it reminds us of, though, is the need for all of us to contribute in the community, for all of us to get vaccinated, that it can have an impact, what we do in the community, how we follow uh, uh, respectfully public health measures and how we act uh, to uh, public health order that's been put in and that uh, will continue to improve situation. Overwhelmingly people are vaccinated in long-term care, both residents and staff. And the impact of that on the outcomes, the most negative outcomes of COVID-19 is also profound. But it doesn't stop uh, outbreaks entirely from happening as we've seen with the, the outbreaks around British Columbia and we'll be doing everything we, we can, of course, to stop that from happening. So yes, we'll review it. Yes, it's significant. Yes, COVID-19 is highly transmissive, uh, particularly now and particularly amongst the unvaccinated. And yes, that has effects on the rest of the population. And that's why um, we need people to get vaccinated. I just want to remind you too, that as of today, 84.2% of vaccinated uh, people have received their first dose immunization from COVID-19 over 12. That's 3.9 million British Columbians have uh, received, more than have received their first dose. That 76.4% um, uh, have now received their second dose. So that's 76.4% have received both doses. Um, about 7.8% have received just one dose and are, will be moving to their second dose either soon or when they're eligible to do so. And the remainder, which is uh, now 15.8%, are not yet vaccinated. And we've got to do everything we can to get that number down and to encourage people to be vaccinated. And I'm happy to say that we continue to see through the weekend with another uh, 15,000 registrations over the last few days, a significant uptick in vaccinations we've seen over the last week, significantly as well in the Interior and Northern Health Authorities. April, do you have a follow-up? I do, yeah. Um, just at Sunset Lodge, uh, the Salvation Army, which runs it, says that all uh, residents, 100% of residents there, are fully vaccinated, um, yet we see 13 testing positive. So I'm just wondering if you think that suggests a need for booster shots, something they're now uh, just announced they're going to be doing in Alberta and have already announced for Ontario as well. Uh, this, so there's two separate issues there too. Of course, uh, immunization is not 100% effective, although it does and has consistently, and you see it in the outcomes, April, I encourage you to look, we release it every Thursday at the outbreak um, information across BC, which we release uh, everywhere to the public every Thursday to look at the impact of vaccination in, uh, in long-term care. With respect to what's sometimes called a third shot or a booster shot, that's something that we are uh, we have been preparing for now for some time. You'll know that uh, Dr. Uh, Penny Ballum is leading our Immunize BC effort across BC. I think it's one of the most successful immunization campaigns in the world. And what we've asked to do is to prepare when public health is ready to say that uh, such a shot would be necessary uh, for a number of groups of people that uh, were prepared and organized to do that both within the long-term care sector and potentially beyond the long-term care sector and for those who have um, uh, who are uh, clinically vulnerable so we're looking at that one of the things about long-term care to keep in mind is that many facilities i'm not sure what was the case at sunset but many facilities received their first dose either in december or the first half of january just to put that in context uh, well, I'm actually in the category of clinically vulnerable. I got my second dose in July. Many people in long-term care uh, got their doses much earlier than that. BC continues to benefit from the decisions made by Dr. Henry to create um, more distance, uh, a larger interval between first and second doses in terms of the durability of the vaccine here. But we are looking at these steps now and we're prepared to take action should that be required and should that be advised by public health, both looking at long-term care but also looking at other sectors. But I don't think it's the case. Um, that this is an issue of a booster shot happening or not happening. It is, of course, possible to see the transmission of COVID-19 even in some vaccinated population. We've received the, um, the uh, 
uh, you, you receive the detailed numbers on that, you're uh, probably 10 times or more likely to, um, to, uh, to uh, test positive for COVID-19, to get COVID-19 if you're not vaccinated. You're more than 20 times more likely to be in hospital if that's the case. And that is the profound argument to, be, uh, to get vaccinated. I encourage everyone to do it for themselves and for people around them who are vulnerable to COVID-19. Our next question is from Mike Hager with Global Mail. Mike, please go ahead. Thanks for taking my call or my question. Um, wanted to um, get some clarity on just what will happen with the enforcement of the passport that's, uh, sorry, the vaccine card that's due to be um, beginning at this time in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have the RCMP union saying rank and file now because there's just not enough of them right now to help uh, businesses enforce these new rules that are upcoming. And uh, you also have a growing number of businesses that are pledging to not ask their patrons uh, about vaccination status and basically uh, reject the, the vaccine card system. So what is the province doing to ensure that, um, you know, the system gets enforced? Well, first of all, um, right now, we know that the vaccine card system will come into place on uh, September 13th. And the thing we can do right now, and I'm encouraged to see so many people in British Columbia, especially so many young people, because the large boost in immunization we've seen is amongst young people. It'd be interesting to note that very soon, those 18 to 24 will have a higher level of vaccination than every age quadrant ahead of them, uh, including up to um, age 50 to 54. That'll be happening soon. They're already more immunized than everyone under 50. So that's a significant improvement in that category. We're seeing very significant improvements in those 12 to 17 and 84.2 percent across the province uh, over 12 is a significant I think achievement of our effort but we're going to continue to push I expect to be uh, by Labor Day over 85 percent and that is um, and that's something we want to continue uh, why are we doing the vaccine card we're doing the vaccine card to allow businesses to stay open in these challenging conditions we're doing the vaccine card of course to encourage immunization, and that has and is having that effect. We're doing the vaccine card to keep people safe, both workers and people who go uh, to events, social events, which all of the, um, the uh, categories of events where the vaccine card apply are, they're social events. So what we're saying is that this is the best possible option, that if, and, and for everybody, and that it's going to be um, put in place by public health order, meaning just like many of the other rules that are applied, for example, in the restaurant sector or other sectors, to keep people healthy, that give confidence in our system, that build confidence in our system, this will be an, uh, of the safety of food and the safety of restaurants, this will be another one of those to ensure that the public is kept safe, to ensure that restaurant employees are kept safe, to ensure that we stop and stop uh, the spread of COVID-19 in those places, and that we encourage vaccination in that process. And there are, of course, alternatives. Some people would argue, well, um, the alternative to, the, to allowing 85% of people to go to restaurants, or 84.2% today, is to shut down those restaurants and go back to takeout for everyone. And I don't think anybody, and this is why the leading advocates for a vaccine card have been in the business community, because they understand and we understand the importance of safety for patrons, that that builds public confidence, that brings everyone, I think, together in common cause. And so I'd encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Yes, over the next week, uh, into next week, we'll be providing details about how it works. But what you need to know now is it's time to get vaccinated. It's time to get vaccinated everywhere. And these will be uh, the rules for the moment, not because we want them to be the rules, but because we're in the middle of a pandemic globally. And that has impact for all of us. And this is one way to deal with it while allowing many of the things that we want to have do and we love doing 
in this in this province to continue to happen. So that's the purpose of it, and I think it'll have broad support. And uh, like every other um, rule that's put in place in these sectors, uh, that is a requirement. This will be a requirement. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, sorry, but I don't think you you really answered that. Um, who should a restaurant call if if they have a patron who wants to get in and refuses? to show proof of vaccination. And then the flip side is what will the province do and through which agency to uh, crack down on businesses that right now are saying, you know, they don't they don't support the system, um, it impinges upon their freedoms, and there's no way that they're going to um, take part in this system. So they're already telegraphing that uh, they want no part of it. So on those two fronts, a business that has a patron that will not uh, answer and prove that they are vaccinated, and then to which agency will the province crack down on uh, businesses that refuse to participate? Well, rules are enforced in BC, and uh, in and support is given by public health agencies, environmental health officers, for example. Um, where disturbances take place, of course, you would expect that where an actual disturbance play, takes place, uh, that uh, police would be called, and that would be an expectation. Uh, in other cases, it's bylaw officers. So uh, this will happen just as all of those other rules that are in place in society uh, get enforced. And I, I think we should remember, I mean, uh, Mike, that's a pretty straightforward answer. Those are the ways that rules get get enforced in society. But I think that the most important thing is that um, we continue to have these activities in our community, community at this time in the pandemic. And that's the purpose of this. This is enabling. It's not uh, intended and it doesn't punish people. It enables these activities to continue safely to build confidence in these sectors and to ensure the safety of people who go to hockey games, the safety of people who go to restaurants, the safe, their safety in a time when we have a very transmissive COVID-19. And so that's the purpose of this, is, uh, is to do that. That's why we need uh, to have a vaccine card for these purposes. And, and uh, I know that it's challenging for people, that this is different, that this is like many of the other things we face during this pandemic, it's different. But what this measure does is builds confidence, I think, in people that they'll be they'll be able to go to restaurants and go to hockey games and go to bars and go to social activities and be safe. And my recommendation to people is this is um, because it's free and readily uh, accessible is to get vaccinated. This is what we need to do together. No one says you have to. But that doesn't mean you can do everything you want. You might want to do if you choose not to get vaccinated. That's just the reality of living in a global pandemic and living in a time when COVID-19 transmits. And let's say finally, this is a vicious virus. You know, I hear from people all the time, it might not affect me as much, or I have a strong immune system, or whatever the thing is. This is a vicious virus. There are people, of course, who passed away from in BC from COVID-19. There are people, of course, who've got sick and continue to be sick from COVID-19. And that's why we need to take these steps to keep people safe, to maintain our activities that make life full and interesting, but also to keep one another safe. And that's the purpose of the BC vaccine card, to do just that. And that's why we're proceeding. Our next question is from Ahmad Agahi, Global News. Ahmad, please go ahead. I'm going to follow up with that. I think the, the concern here with the vaccine card isn't uh, around it being uh, and why it's in place. Uh, I think there are concerns in the industry on how they can go about um, working with the, the province to, to enforce it. And, and for example, a restaurant or a, a eatery or a bar has concerns over how their newly trained hostess or host will have to encounter that situation and and they're i think they're asking for more guidance on what it will look like and uh and with the police union having concerns about uh, budgeting and resources 
I'm also wondering when this program was being thought of and put into place, if there was any discussion had on um, bringing in some budget and resource to the RCMP just so that they uh, don't have to take away officers from other calls that may be more urgent to deal with it. Well, um, I'd say for starters that the reason that the BC vaccine card was brought in wasn't because any of this is easy. None of it is easy. It's been brought in uh, to help keep people safe, to keep workers safe. It, there was a broad and significant call for this in the business community, but in other communities as well. I think a vast majority of British Columbians support this step and see this step as necessary and see this step as building confidence. And every time you take action, we had a long discussion of this, and we've had different discussions of this around issues around masks. And in a general sense, that has been handled, I think, very well in workplaces, very well by workers. And when I talk to people, for example, at Save on Foods uh, this past weekend, they say that in some ways the clarity of the rule, which is an enforceable rule, has made it easier for them, not harder for them. So yes, there are going to be um, issues around enforcement. It's why we're very careful. There are, of course, issues around privacy, and that's of critical importance. We'll be taking our time with that and making sure that that is right, and we're doing that work with the Privacy Commissioner. There's going to be issues around people who have difficulty or who aren't, um, uh, don't have a, uh, a smartphone and don't, aren't easily able to access that information to ensure everyone will have access. We've seen some challenges in the province of Quebec, although they're proceeding, and uh, it seems to me on balance that they're doing very well there with a similar approach. We'll be providing all of the information and working very, very carefully with the business community to make sure that they have access to the information they need um, to see this process go forward. So uh, yes, um, there is always the uncertainty of something that was never in place before and is now in, going to be in place on September 13th. But we're going to work through these issues with uh, uh, all of our partners to make sure that uh, this is a success for people. And the most important part, of course, uh, builds confidence and ensures that people are safer from the transmission of COVID-19. Ahmad, do you have a follow-up? Yes, if I may. And thanks for that answer. And you touched on it a little bit, but I was going to hope for a little bit more information on how this will work for the disenfranchised. So uh, maybe those that uh, are older and maybe you don't have access or the ability to work a smartphone app or uh, the homeless who may not have a phone altogether or anybody else in that situation. Um, uh, is there some relief to their concerns right now looking at this um, program that you can offer? Well, this is this program is going to come into effect on uh, on uh, September 13th, and the requirement to be vaccinated, first dose vaccinated, uh, um, against COVID-19 to do a certain number of things that were listed off related to the BC vaccine card that will be in place by September 13th. Um, by October 24th, of course, it will require both doses of a COVID-19 vaccine by October 24th, and that is what people need to be concerned with, I think, most importantly now. And we're seeing that happen. We've had in, in the last week, um, I believe, in the, in the area of 44,000 uh, first dose immunizations over the last seven days, a significant increase, I think more than double over the previous week. That was highest in the Interior Health Authority and the Northern Health Authority. And so as we noted, and as Dr. Henry noted and Premier Horgan noted when we announced the BC vaccine card last week, there will be an alternative to smartphone for people who require that alternative. And that will be in place. And we'll be providing a full briefing to everybody in the province on the details of that well in advance of it coming into place. So all of those things are being worked through and we're going to work through them methodically, step by step, as we have at every point in the pandemic. And listen, I understand it's hard, right? And um, one of the things that I'm proudest of in BC is how we've come together as people to respond to these extraordinary circumstances. I'm very proud of it in healthcare as Minister of Health and uh, listening to uh, Catalina talked today about her work and talking to healthcare workers, as I do all the time, how people have come together. And I expect we'll do so uh, again around this. It is challenging, and 
I um, am respectful of everybody. The purpose of this is to ensure that people are safer. The purposes of this is to build confidence that the activities that we can do together are safe. The purpose of this is to increase our level of vaccination, which will benefit all of us. And that's, uh, that's what we're going forward with. We're going we're gonna to take account of the needs of people who aren't, um, don't have or aren't as familiar with smartphones and work with them. And you'll get information about that well in advance of the launch date. My next question is from Marcello Bernardo, News 1130. Marcello, please go ahead. Hi, Minister Dixon. Thank you for taking questions on uh, these other matters today because I kind of knew that this wasn't going to happen with the HEU announcement. But um, just wanting to see if you can explain, because you said last week that staff will not be required to be vaccinated where customers must show proof. So doesn't that still pose a risk if unvaccinated workers at a restaurant are interacting with customers? Um, here's what I'd say. I'd say that the purpose of the BC vaccine card, as opposed to employer-employee thing, and I'll talk about long-term care in a second, uh, Marcella. The purpose of the BC vaccine card is that when you're taking part in these optional activities that are, uh, are very important to all of us, but not requirements of life, that you be vaccinated and that you be safe. And that's the purpose of the BC vaccine card. There will be employers who take other actions working with their workforces, and you see that happening. In the case of, um, for example, the work I do in, uh, as Minister of Health, we're requiring all long-term care staff and assisted living staff to be vaccinated by October 12th. And uh, that's not easy either for anybody to make requirements of people who have given everything, and we ask them to do more things, and we expect it as a condition, um, not easy, but necessary. And we'll look at other areas where that's required as well, particularly in healthcare, I would expect. You'll see us say more about other areas of healthcare in the same regard in the coming days. Uh, that's necessary. So I think what this does is it makes all of us safer uh, in all of these environments. And I think it's also obviously a significant incentive and uh, obviously working with employers, we want everyone to get vaccinated. And uh, it's our hope that uh, we get as close to 100% as possible. We know that's not going to happen. Uh, that we know we're not going to get to 100%, Marcella, but it's, this is, um, this is, uh, these are important uh, steps to take. And that's why we've taken this action, similar to what other jurisdictions have had for a BC vaccine card that deals with these activities. What happens the issues in workplace and keeping workplace safe? We, of course, have been a central focus of what we've done for months and months and months and months. Marcella, do you have a follow up? I do. So, if, if you could just say, why is it that employers are not being asked to um, force their staff to get vaccinated? Because I'm assuming that the staff um, who want to go to a restaurant, who want to go to a concert, who want to go to a hockey game will have to have proof of vaccination if they go somewhere else. Um, but my other question to you was to, to ask what adjustments are being made when it comes to faith gatherings, because I found out over the weekend that there are many people that are concerned about people not having to wear masks when they go to church services. So is that going to be adjusted as well? Um, well, with respect to, to faith gatherings, um, uh, you know, I think that we have done um, really since March 2020, an extraordinary amount of work with faith communities to have COVID safety in place in those communities. And of course, for a long time, a significant time, particularly through the end of last year and the beginning of this year, including at major religious holidays of all faiths, um, we were not essentially allowing people to come together. And what we did was we did the work. Dr. Henry has led that work. The Premier has led that work with faith gatherings to ensure that, uh, that faith gatherings uh, take place in, uh, in uh, safety. And all uh, faith communities have such plans in place and uh, naturally are expected to. They're not expected to just by public health, but they, uh, as, you, as you know, faith, gatherings ta faith communities take this very seriously. The safety of, uh, of members in faith communities is a very important thing. And that's something that, uh, that we see as a priority. So right now, 
we put back in place, uh, the public health put back in place last Tuesday, a province-wide mask mandate in uh, a broad variety of circumstances. And that, that mask mandate um, will, uh, is in place. As you know, we put it in place a week ago last Friday in interior health, in the central Okanagan local health area before that. And that's for a broad number of activities and communities. And I have to say, um, I was briefly at the Metro Town Mall. I saw a lot of people. I saw no one without a mask. I've been to Save On Foods. I saw a lot of people. No one was without a mask. I went to Safeway at Kingsway and Kine. I saw a lot of people. No one wasn't wearing a mask. And I think that when you, in faith communities as well, uh, at least in the, in the two services that I've attended uh, recently, uh, overwhelmingly people are wearing a mask and I attended a funeral on the weekend of a very prominent person in uh, in New Westminster um, Jerry Mercer a great really a great Canadian in New Westminster who recently passed away that happened with a small group and uh, with people at a distance so I think faith communities are responding to this as well in a positive way and we're seeing that in terms of outcomes we we look at every case uh, Marcello every single case and where we see transmission right now is in so social gatherings, and that's why we've taken the actions we've taken. We have time for one more question today, and that will be from Bonit Brake with CBC. Bonit, please go ahead. Thanks for taking my question. So BC saw its highest COVID numbers since April 4th on Friday, and while vaccine passports are coming, people will be moving inside as the weather changes. Just wanting to know, is the province looking at further measures to curb the growth of the fourth wave? Well, um, first of all, we want to continue uh, and to significantly increase immunization in our province. Uh, we have one of the highest levels now in Canada and we need it to be higher. You see when you see the vast majority of cases in the small number and the small percentage of those who are unvaccinated, how effective immunization can be, vaccination can be. And so we want that number to continue to be higher. It's going to be more than 85 by Labor Day, 85 percent. That means there'll be 15 percent left who are not uh, fully vaccinated. That's three out of every 20 people. And we need to work on that and continue to reduce that number. So that's first of all. Second of all, we need and we will have a very significant uh, effort to deal with other respiratory illnesses, particularly influenza in the season, because we, we had, I think, a great deal of success last year and some good fortune in the lack of influenza in a, in a critical time in our province. We need to focus on that again. We've just put in place, as you know, a province-wide mask mandate uh, as of last Tuesday. In addition, we, we will not be going at the first available date, September 7th, the first possible date under our plan, to step four in our reopening plan. And of, and of course, we'll be bringing in place on September 13th, and then for both doses, October 24th, the vaccine passport. And what we're gonna do is continue to do what we've been doing from the beginning, which is adapt. We understand that measures affect people. We understand they affect people. We understand that every time you take a step, that it has other consequences. We know, for example, and here with my colleague, uh, my former colleague, uh, Judy Darcy, we know the impact that the pandemic had of people living with addiction and the risk that it put into their lives. So we know these things have an impact. But these are steps we're taking, but we will take the steps that are necessary to take. And we'll have a lot more to say about that tomorrow. And you'll see uh, the updated view on, uh, on, uh, on modeling and on where we are in the COVID-19 pandemic from Dr. Henry and myself tomorrow. And, uh, and that will give people a, chan a chance to assess where we are. But these are significant actions that we're taking. They're significant ones that are in place. And we need to take those actions, including safety plans in schools and in uh, both K-12 and uh, post-secondary education to keep uh, children and students safe. Bonnie, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. The police union says it has concerns about the idea that the Premier floated of calling police to deal with vaccine passports. They say they are already stretched. Uh, has the province spoken to police and will there be more resources allocated to police departments? Uh, look, uh, of course. I mean, of course. Um, there, uh, there are going to be challenges when you're bringing in something new, such as the BC vaccine card, which we brought into place September 13th. And I encourage everyone to get immunized. And like similar measures that are in place now to ensure public health, there are enforcement mechanisms. Some of them 
are through health authorities. Some of them are through bylaw officers, and some of them, when necessary, of course, um, will involve uh, the police if that should that be necessary. But I, I think, in general, what I hope and what I expect to happen is that many people in the next days will get vaccinated, that British Columbians will respond to, the, to a sense of fairness and the requirements to keep one another safe that I think have been a hallmark of our behavior as people everywhere in BC throughout this pandemic. And I expect that to be the case with respect to the BC vaccination card. And we'll be supporting businesses because many of this, much of this, of course, takes place in businesses out there. We'll be supporting businesses and working with them in the period leading up to the 13th to make sure people are ready. And there will be things and you're seeing this in the province of Quebec right now, that aren't anticipated and we'll respond to them as well. But working together, this is something that we can do and we need to do because we need to keep, it's important that we reduce transmission of COVID-19. It's important that we keep people as safe as possible. It's important that we keep all of these important things in society open. And that means taking the measures necessary to keep them open. It's important that we do all of these things. And that's why we're taking the steps that we're taking uh, with the BC vaccine card. That's why so much work has gone into it. And that's why we're going to go through this period and work methodically with all the people involved to make sure it works effectively. I think that's, that's all it. the time we have for today. Is that all thank the time? You. Yes. Thank you, thank everyone, you. for joining. Thank you. See you tomorrow.